Right. Good morning, everyone. My name's James Smith. I'm Research Director here at the Resolution Foundation. Uh, welcome to you all, uh, particularly people who fought their way in through the train chaos this morning. There's quite a few people, brave souls, here this morning, so that's, uh, that's particularly appreciated, uh, especially early on a Monday morning, dealing with that. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking you're, you've sort of had crisis overload here. So we've had the cost of living crisis, we've had the COVID-19 crisis, we've had Brexit, the financial crisis, but this morning we're going to talk about the daddy of them all. We're going to talk about the housing crisis and we're going to focus on the, on the rental market particularly. Now, um, lower home ownership, particularly among the, uh, among the young and people on lower income, basically means that we're more reliant than ever before on the uh, on the rental sector and whether rents go up or down will really matter for uh, people's living standards so the rent the, the rent sector is incredibly important um, and at the moment we basically have a situation where house prices are falling but we're still seeing rents shooting up um, so with this this, as I say, will be incredibly important for what's going on uh, with living standards. So today we're going to make sense of it all for you. Uh, you're going to leave this uh, very, very clear. For fortunately, you don't have to rely on me for that. So we have a, a, a great panel uh, to, to talk about all these things. So we're going to start with uh, Cara Pacitti here, a, a senior economist at the foundation who will take us through the findings of a, a report that we published this morning that sets out very clearly what's, uh, what's going on in the rental market. And then we're going to hear from Richard Donnell, who is uh, head of research and insight at a little website called Zoopla that you might have heard of that uh, uh, we all look at for religiously for uh, what's actually going on in the housing market. And then we're going to hear from Mira Chinderoy, who is uh, Deputy Director of Campaigns at the National Landlords Association. So you can actually find out what's going on uh, with landlords. Now, as ever, uh, people at home can, uh, uh, are watching online can get involved. The hashtag is rising rents, uh, just to give you a sense of what's actually going on here. And you could put questions on Slido um, and those all pop up and through some IT magic that I have clearly mastered uh, will appear in this room. So uh, for people actually in the room, you can do the old fashioned thing and put your hands up. So uh, get, get your questions ready for, for that. Um, and uh, we, can, we can do things the old fashioned way as well. Um, so we've got a lot to cover, lots going on. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to Cara to, to tell us what's actually going on. More technology to work out. Great, thanks James. Um, I'd also like, before, um, before I start the presentation, to thank Lindsay Judge and Mike Brewer from the Resolution Foundation for all their help with this report. Um, so the backdrop to this research is one that's going to be very familiar to anyone who's recently tried to rent a home. The really significant rises we've seen in the prices of rents over the past two years. So looking at official data that covers all rents, and that includes a lot of renters who haven't moved or haven't had their rent increased over this time, um, that's the light blue bar on this chart. Um, rents have risen by nearly 15% since January 2022, whereas market data that looks just at rents for new tenancies suggests rents have risen by nearly a fifth. fifth. And as James mentioned, with many more families renting in the UK than in previous generations and renting for longer into their lives, high rents pose a significant challenge to living standards. So this report looks at what's been driving the high growth we've seen and also what we can expect looking ahead. So I'm going to start by looking at three popular explanations, which we don't think, in isolation, provide a convincing explanation for the high growth we've seen. Um, if I can get this to move. Brilliant. Um, so the first of these um, is that many have suggested that recent rent rises have been caused by the rising costs of interest on buy-to-let mortgages, which landlords have then passed on to their tenants. And it's definitely true that many landlords, including the one you can see in this agony ant column here, will have wanted to cover these costs. And there are certainly landlord-tenant imbalances here, particularly in sort of markets that are seeing very, very high demand. 
but it's not the case that landlords as a whole can just choose to increase prices in isolation from wider changes in the rental market. If landlords wanted to increase the price of their property dramatically, unless there were wider changes in the market, they'd soon find themselves struggling to rent it out. And of course, if it was the case that landlords could unilaterally decide that rental prices should rise, then why wouldn't landlords have been increasing rents long before the recent rise in interest rates? So something's changed in the rental market, um, which some have put down to our second explanation, which should hopefully be appearing shortly. Brilliant. Um, which is that as a result of these sort of higher mortgage costs, or, or sometimes um, it's put down to the, the welcome regulation of the rental sector that's in the pipeline, landlords have been exiting the sector in droves, leading to a shortage of properties and so high prices for those properties that are left. And to some extent, it does look like landlords have been leaving the sector over the past few years. So this is some Bank of England analysis that pins down properties that were previously rented, have since been sold and then not rented out again. And these figures suggest that the private rental sector has shrunk by around 47,000 properties since mid-2019. So why doesn't that plausibly explain the high rises in rents we've seen? Well, firstly, the shrinking is relatively small. So 47,000 is only about 1% of the total size of the private rental sector. And secondly, for each home sold out of the private rented sector into the owner-occupied sector, there's likely to be a corresponding reduction in demand for private rental properties. So these homes aren't disappearing. But is there a wider reduction in the overall supply of homes? They might not be disappearing um, from the private rented sector. But then another explanation that's been offered is that there's just been an overall increase in the number of people compared to the number of homes in the UK, and that has driven higher competition for rental properties and higher prices. This isn't something we can currently see in the data. So overall, the UK might have a shortage of homes. This might not be the ideal number of dwellings per 1,000 families. Um, but the number of homes per 1,000 families has stood at 780 by 2022, essentially the same as what it was at the turn of the millennium in 2000, and it's actually seen some improvement over recent years. The changes in the population we've seen since then might slightly change this picture, but it's unlikely the population on its own can explain the dramatic rises in aggregate private rents that we've seen since 2022. So what's actually been causing the rental price rises we've seen in recent years? Well, in the long term, rental prices tend to rise in line with average earnings. The ratio of rents to earnings in the UK has remained broadly stable since the turn of the millennium to the eve of the pandemic. What's happened since then? Well, we've seen two periods of economic turmoil, firstly the pandemic and then the cost of living crisis. So looking firstly at the pandemic, we knew this was a time of significant disruption to everyone's lives as well as the housing market. We saw welcome legislation to protect renters from evictions. There was dramatic changes in the local rental markets as cities emptied and many returned to families elsewhere in the country or, or overseas. And the result was a weakening of rents relative to earnings, putting the rent to earnings ratio well below trend, as you can see from the dotted line in this chart. At the start of 2022, average rents were about 5% or £50 a month, lower than would be expected if the relationship between rents to earnings was in keeping with longer term trends. So it's highly likely that at least some of the recent surge in rental prices, um, particularly in urban areas, has been a correction, returning the rent to earnings ratio back to its pre-pandemic trend. What we've then seen since the pandemic is a rapid surge in inflation over the cost of living crisis, which has also le led to surging nominal earnings. Earnings have grown by around 12% since January 2022. In the context of, a sort of pandemic catch up and really high earnings growth, it's perhaps unsurprising we've seen really strong rental price growth over the past two years. So we've looked at sort of key drivers of higher rental price growth we've seen over two years. What can we expect looking ahead? Well, given we're several years on from the pandemic and high interest rates are starting to put the brakes on the economy and earnings growth is starting to cool off in the latest data, we would expect rental price growth for new tenancies to start to cool. Reassuringly, this is what we have started seeing in the latest data, with the rental price growth for new tenancies slowing from 10.4% over the year to June 2023 to just 7.5% over the year to March 2024. And looking abroad, we've seen similar trends with the US also seeing the same burst of rental price growth that we're, we've been experiencing, which is now eased in the US, with rental price growth for new tenancies falling below earnings growth. So that looks like an uncharacteristically positive note to the end of a presentation about housing in the 2020s, but there are key reasons not to be sanguine about the pressures facing renters over the coming years. 
While rental price growth for new tenancies is set to ease, it will take some time for the rental price rises we've seen to filter through the total stock of rents. The average rent paid by the total population of renters will continue to rise and potentially rise faster than earnings growth over the years to come, as renters, have yet to see, renters who have yet to see the large price rent hikes we've seen in the market reach the end of their tenancies or are forced to accept within tenancy price rises. If, for example, we assumed that the ratio of rents to earnings in the UK would return to its pre-pandemic level in three years' time, the total stock of rents would need to see over 13% price growth over the next, 10 years, next, sorry, next three years, compared to just 7.5% growth in earnings the OBR expects, or around 4.2% growth a year on average. So the pressure on renters as a whole will likely continue for another few years yet, and these price rises will be difficult for many renters to adjust to, given that other essentials, including food and energy, are taking up more than families' wages than they were back in 2022. What does this mean for policy? Well, the most important group to protect from these rising rents are low-income renters who rely on government support and local housing allowance to pay their housing costs. The government made the very welcome decision to increase local housing allowance from this month to align it with rental prices. However, from next year onwards, rates are set to be frozen, shifting the burden of dealing with these high rental costs back to low-income households. So to conclude, We've seen rapid earnings growth and a post-pandemic readjustment, which are possibly the main drivers of the high rental price growth we've seen. Rental price growth for these new tenancies should start to ease as earnings begin to fall, but the stock will take time to adjust, with average rents continuing to rise for several years. And most crucially, policies support low-income renters over this period by committing to consistently upgrade local housing allowance in line with, um, in line with local rents, and also easing the benefits cap that means a lot of renters in, in high housing cost areas aren't seeing the full benefit of their housing support. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Cara. <laughs> right, so we've got, we've got rents easing, but it's gonna take a while for uh, that, the higher rents level to feed through the stock. So there's some good news here. Um, is that how you're seeing things, Richard? Yeah, I think... Um Look, first of all, great report from the Resolution Foundation um, covering all the kind of key topics. A particular one is this, what's happening to rents for new lets, which is the sort of movers experience. I think a lot of people have been put off moving or can't move because rents to move are so high has big impacts to the economy. But this tension or this differential between new lets versus the stock of renting is really important. And you're, you're right that there is going to be a flow through with the average tenancy of four years now, we are seeing rental growth for new lets slowing fast. Um, it's really being led by London. We've Rents have rebounded so aggressively in London after the pandemic. They've literally, we've sort of hit affordability ceilings. So we've got rental growth in inner London now at plus 2%. I don't think it will go negative. We just haven't got enough supply coming through. So that tight supply is almost creating a sort of floor in how much uh, rents, um, they're not going to fall basically. Um, I think that the point you made is also really important. I think the rental market, rents were sort of under-rented. Rents weren't where they needed to be um, as we sort of entered the pandemic. Um, the rental market grew very quickly up until 2016. There was a sort of surge of new supply um, because of tax changes announced ahead of time. So we had a surge of supply up until 2016. Um, we also then had falling mortgage rates. We had help to buy. It was much easier for first-time buyers to access home ownership. 75% of first-time buyers are renters. So there was a decent outflow. And then, so rents really underperformed. They were under-rented. And then we've, as you say, we've seen that, but we have seen rental, rent bounce back almost too fast for new lets now. And I think affordability pressures are going to create a real, a real drag on, uh, on rental growth in the near term. And look, our measure of rental affordability shows we're at sort of peak rental unaffordability at the moment, which is why I think you know, rental growth is going to slow. Having said that, in some sort of peripheral in the sort of cheaper areas, so if you look at around big cities like the places like Oldham, Walsall, um, Newark, I mean, rental growth is still 14, 15, 16% for new tenancies. Even in outer London, you go to Barking and Dagenham, Havering and places, rental growth is still in double digits. So there's a kind of cascading effect still working its way through as people purely seek value for money. I think the, the big story here is just flat supply. The rental market more than doubled in size by 2016, and it's been the same size, about five and a half million homes for the last eight years, basically. And so landlords leaving the market have been offset by landlords coming into the market. 
we're sort of 80% of the way through a sort of rationalisation the rental market. You know, we see 10% of homes of sale on Zoopla were formally rented out. It's not an exodus, but it's just a shake out as landlords who were kind of in it by accident. I think 40% of landlords bought their first property to live in, not to rent out. So higher rates, slower rental growth, more regulation, people just having to treat it as a business now. And a lot of people didn't get into it as a business and they're the ones now selling up. And again, the way mortgage, mortgage regulations and mortgage affordability works, most of the people selling up are in London, the South East, where frankly, it's very hard to make a 50% loan to value plus mortgage work um, in London, the South East. So a lot of landlords don't want to put more money in when they come to refinance, so they're looking to sell. Probably great for George Osborne and others and the fact that the average rented property being sold is 25% lower than the average value of a homeowner home. So it's brilliant for first time buyers um, who, are, who are sort of probably buying these properties up basically. So rental growth, the rental market's been pretty flat. And I think the other big challenge here for the rental market, the third point really, and the final point is this rapid growth in the private rendered sector was sort of papered over the cracks of us not building enough social rented homes for the last 20 years. And this is why we have nearly one in four renters in the private rented sectors on housing benefit. As soon as that sector stops growing and you add huge demand side pressures from record immigration, record overseas student numbers, um, higher interest rates, making it more unaffordable to buy a property. This is what we've seen, this, this real squeeze coming through. And um, it's brilliant. We're going to get the LHA reset. We do an annual report for crisis on this. I mean, we were down to like six, seven percent of homes listed for sale on Zoopla could be rented by someone on benefit. Um, for me, the 30th percentile, the way it's set, is still effectively more like the 25th, 25th percentile at the moment, not the 30th. So there's a real squeeze there coming through on, on low income renters, which I don't see changing in a hurry. So my final thoughts are it's going to remain tough for renters, I'm afraid. I think mortgage regulations for home buyers is going to keep the pressure and keep people sort of trapped in home ownership, sorry, trapped in renting if they want to buy a home, particularly in the south of England. Um, we're only going to ease the pressure on the rental market through growing more supply, particularly social homes. Um, rent controls really don't work and it's going to be interesting sort of to see what happens in Scotland, particularly how rent controls in Scotland, current and proposed, stop the flow of new investment. You know, we want to get investment and supply coming through. And my final point is, you know, both political parties talking about home ownership and getting home ownership back up to a certain level. Well, it'd be great to have some policies for a stable, balanced private rental market and the role that plays in a, in a balanced and healthy economy. Right. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> OK, so uh, a, a, a bleak picture for, for those trying to rent. Now, how are things looking for, for landlords, Mir? Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. It's a really interesting report, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, we agree with much of what's in the report in terms of uh, the, the trend for rents to track wages, but I think the issue of supply is really one which... Um, we are seeing from our members um, coming through uh, very strongly. We saw during COVID that demand dropped in urban areas, uh, particularly in London, and it grew in other areas. But now, as Richard mentioned, there's been a sort of rapid unwinding of this and the demands returning to those urban areas, rents going up rapidly. Um, and of course, this happened at the same time that interest rates were also rising, uh, inflation was rising, and on the interest rates for landlords, there's been an additional sort of policy change where the mortgage interest relief, which was um, uh, which has been introduced over a number of years, was fully Im implemented from the 2020 to 21 tax year. So at the same time that interest rates were growing um, at a rapid rate, um, landlords are paying, uh, are unable to claim back as much relief on the uh, interest rates that they're paying on their mortgages. So, for example, a landlord with one property around the average property value and a 50% loan to value ratio mortgage would have been almost £3,000 worse off with interest rates rising from 1.9% to 4.8%. Um, and modelling by Capital Economics has shown that the restrictions in, in mortgage interest relate relief have contributed to 1.6 million fewer properties in the private rental sector than would have been had had investment stayed at a, a stable level from uh, the pre-MIR um, changes um, and that the reintroduction of MIR would encourage landlords to absorb 
that rise in interest rates more than they're able to do so at the moment and and so therefore have less pressure to raise rents um, so uh, that policy change I think has has been compounded by this uh, interest rate rise which might not have been anticipated at the time that the policy was introduced um, and then the other issues that our members are talking about are just the uncertainty in the market at the moment uh, the uncertainty around the finances, but also uncertainty around rental reform, around energy efficiency, efficiency changes, um, causing landlords to have less confidence to invest than they may have done in the past. Um, we are seeing that there is, a, from our own uh, membership, there is a historic gap between the high levels of landlords who are selling properties and the um, low no, low percentage who are investing. But we're also seeing when you dig into that, that it tends to be uh, older landlords who are more likely to be selling properties and younger landlords who tend to be more likely to be uh, buying. Um, so uh, while your research shows that there's um, not necessarily a very large change in the number of properties in the sector, those um, those landlords are sort of rationalising their portfolios and, and the, the properties are moving between different landlords, which causes pressure on tenants as well because uh, there may be ten higher turnover of tenancies when those properties change hands. Um, we also see um, at high, um, high levels of demand from tenants and our, our members are only just starting to see that demand slightly falling um, in, in the last couple of uh, quarters, um, but still at very, very high levels. And um, there's an average of 15 inquiries per rental ad, um, at the moment, which is twice the pre-pandemic level. So that demand and supply imbalance is really having an impact on um, the levels of uh, rent that the, that the market can sustain. Um, Broadly, we would agree with the recommendations, would echo uh, Rich's comments about rent control and the impact that that has on investment. But it is essential that renters and receipts of benefits are able to access housing. Um, in the short to the medium term, we would want to see LHA um, annually uprated to at least the 30th percentile of market rents and removing the benefit cap or at minimum ring fencing LHA so that tenants are able to pay their rent and landlords have confidence that they're able to pay their rent would, would assure people to, to be able to access uh, PRS housing. Associated with this, there is a lack of confidence from landlords around the universal credit system, um, things like the five week wait, the, um, the inability of tenants to have a free choice about whether to pay their, um, the, the housing element of LHA uh, of universal credit directly to landlords has an impact on landlords' confidence that that, that rent will be paid um, on time, and uh, some some changes to the universal credit system would help with that. Um, and fundamentally, further investment in house building across all tenures um, is vital. There is a flexibility in the PRS which is useful to the housing mix but it shouldn't be a substitute for social housing um, and private landlords are not usually set up to provide the support that some tenants need to sustain tenancies so um, increasing house building across across all tenures would be uh, essential to address supply all right thank you <laughs> okay so rents are going up things are not looking good for renters Things are not brilliant for landlords either. So this has taken a slightly gloomier turn after uh, Cara's note of optimism earlier. So um, people in the room should, should get ready with their questions. Uh, what we're going to do is basically do a bit, a bit more on some of the, the kind of myths that have uh, uh, come around that uh, Cara touched on in, in her talk about what's actually happening uh, in the rental sector. We'll talk about some other factors, what's going on elsewhere, and then we'll get a bit more into some of the policy things that uh, that people have talked about. Now, I'm going to start with a couple of questions on Slido, which pick up on this um, issue about um, 
what's been happening in terms of landlords actually exiting uh, the sector. So this one from Robin, I think, is a is a good one to to sort of get the ball rolling. And I'll, I'll start with Mira on uh, on this. Basically, basically asking, um, you know, how, what's really been happening and what in terms of landlords exiting. And is there a sort of geographical dimension to that? Has that kind of been um, feeding in a little bit uh, to you know what we've seen a bit of mismatch um, in the market as well? What 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 are your thoughts on that, Mira? So um, we are seeing that there is a there is a range across across the the country, but um, I think the the challenge is particularly key in areas such as London, where there are there's a there's a particular uh, issue with the impact of the interest rates and the, the possibility of landlords being able to invest in those areas. Um, so uh, the, the impact of interest rates is really one which we can see in terms of landlord demand, um, uh, landlord uh, investment. Um, and uh, it's, uh, but it's one which we, uh, we see is having that sort of different impact in different parts of the country. Um, the tenant demand is also there as well. So it's, it depends on the impact of the, 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 uh, the level of tenant demand in, in urban areas versus the ability of landlords to actually invest in those areas. Now, now do, you, do you get the sense that it's been a long time since interest rates were up at uh, five and a quarter, so you have to go back to sort of pre-financial crisis period. Do, do you detect that there's a bit more sensitivity among landlords now? Do, are we seeing them exiting a little bit more quickly now than we might have expected given what's happening to rates? Do you, do you think the outside options in terms of house prices are helping with that? In terms of house prices? Being relatively high. Oh, and so they have the option to leave. Um, I think that la some landlords are seeing that there is that that option now might be better to take that option now rather than wait. Um, but that's also, uh, we're also hearing a lot about the uncertainty around rental reform and energy efficiency and seeing potential costs coming down the line and not being clear exactly what those costs are going to be. So whether it's better to make that choice now um, rather than uh, the uncertainty that's around some of the other policy changes that are happening in the sector. Right. Is that now, Richard? Is it is this tallying with with what what you guys are seeing? I think so. I think it's again. I made the point when I was doing my presentation about. I think we've got to see that period of rapid growth was effectively people getting into investing in property, but not as a not as a sort of cash flow operational business. It's more of a kind of leveraged capital growth play, basically. And I think what we're seeing now with the um, tax reforms that were talked about and higher rates. It's just forcing private landlords to reconsider what they're owning and is it the investment I thought it was and, I, and am I really in this as a business? And actually a lot are, um, but it comes to this point that 20% of private landlords own half of rented housing now. So I think they're the people who are investing, seeing it as a business, reorganising into limited company structures. It's the people who, look, I was never in this as a business, there was a lot of capital gains. Over the pandemic, the sales market was very hot, so I'll sell. And I think... Again, we've got to remember that 40% of landlords don't have a mortgage. So higher rates and pushing up rents is not a factor. About another third of landlords have got small mortgages, so they can deal with higher rates. It's the third of it's about 30% of landlords with loan to values over 50. They're the ones who've really been squeezed. And so this is why you get a sort of smaller, quote unquote, set exodus. Um, and again, it's slightly above average in London, the southeast, for the reasons we talked about. You know, you, can't, you literally can't have more than 50% loan to value if you want to be a landlord in London. And with sort of limited prospects for house price growth, there are probably lots of other places to put your money if you've got money to invest at the moment. So which is why it's unlikely you're going to see a lot more supply in the short term. Sorry. I think capital gains is also something to consider in terms of the number of properties which landlords might be disposing of because uh, there have been changes to capital gains in, in recent years, um, which mean that uh, it, it, uh, there's less um, or the, there's, a, there's a lower uh, threshold for the point at which you start paying capital gains. Um, so uh, 
that is also going to have an impact on what the choices that landlords are making and capital gains is definitely one of the issues which our landlords are concerned about. Right. Let, let's zoom out a bit more to the sort of general supply issues that we've uh, we've got here. So um, there's uh, there's a question here which gets a little bit of this. So I'm going to come to to Cara first on uh, uh, what's been going on with supply. So um, this question is really about: um, Are we seeing you know a sort of shift in the composition of houses that are going out there? So are we seeing landlords selling uh, to homeowners who are, uh, are putting, um, who are uh, having bigger houses, um, owning with you know lower density of how they're living? Is that really affecting what we're seeing? Is it, how big a deal do you think supply is in all this, Cara? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question because I think some of why we've been a little bit sceptical about people saying reason rental prices are high is because landlords are exiting sectors. Not that landlords aren't exiting sectors. We've heard there is some evidence that it's happening. But it's just that unless a property somewhere is sitting empty, then at either a, a renter at some point in the chain in that housing transaction has become an owner occupier or um, that landlord just sold to another landlord. So the, the, the kind of overall, if all the houses are still occupied, and there isn't an overall shift in the kind of supply and demand for the private rented sector. Um, but I think the main caveat, I guess the caveat is that in some local areas there might be some sort of uh, kind of really big kind of supply and demand imbalances, so you might end up with some vacant properties. Um, but the other caveat is this one, which I think is a really important one, which is that um, private renters tend to kind of less densely occupy their homes, so they have about 10% less floor space per person than an owner occupier. So it might mean that kind of on aggregate, if you move lots of homes from the private rental sector into the New York private sector, you have less people living in those homes. So that might be a kind of impact on sort of overall aggregate supply, just because um, there are essentially fewer people living in the same floor space if a home homes are moving from the PRS into the owner occupier sector. So I think this is a caveat, but given it's only sort of about 10% um, less uh, densely occupied homes in the owner occupier sector, and we think the PRS has maybe shrunk around 1%, you're still talking very small changes in supply in our opinion, um, albeit the data is not brilliant, so we might have to revise that view in future. All right, so let, let's talk about what, what, what we think sort of has been driving what's going on. And I, I suppose I wanted to, to sort of think about this in terms of the, the kind of uncertainty, the big changes in economic conditions that are sort of affecting what's going on um, in the housing market, so particularly on earnings and um, interest rates. And I, I'll start with uh, Mira on this. So I, I guess the question here is, we're, we're in this incredibly uncertain period. So we've had um, earnings shooting up as part of the cost of living crisis in, in cash terms. They're only growing fairly modestly in real terms, but cash increases in earnings will feed through into cash increases in, in rents. And then the other thing sitting in the background is basically what's been happening with interest rates, where we've seen this absolutely secular change from that ultra low pre-pandemic interest rates to now very high interest rates. Now, obviously, permeates through to all sorts of um, issues in, in the housing market. I suppose my question here is, um, what, what, how, do, um, how do landlords um, think about those kind of big forces that are shaping the sector? Is that, a, um, and is uncertainty about where earnings are going, where interest rates are going, how, how do landlords go about re responding to that? Um, I think the reality is that the vast majority of landlords in the sector in this country are individuals and they have um, relatively small portfolios um, and are responding to the immediate um, costs that they're facing. So whether that be rising interest rates or the impact of inflation on the cost of maintaining a property, those are the sorts of things that we're hearing from our members are um, having an impact. And um, as I said, the MIRR change has, has caused the interest rate um, increase to uh, have an even bigger impact on, on um, 
on some landlords. So I don't think there's necessarily um, a sort of very long forward look to see what's going, what's happening. Everybody the, isn't doing their own interest rate forecast. I don't think so. <laughs> um, and I think the the recent sort of turmoil in terms of interest rates um, it has meant that it's it's been um, something which landlords have had have, have had to respond to quickly more quickly than. Um, they may have done with a sort of shallower uh, increase. Um, but uh, as Cara's report shows, that rolling out into existing tenancies takes time. Um, and um, it's, uh, there's, there's a mix of things happening at the moment. There's landlords who can't continue to let at the, at the, um, at the rent that they were previously letting at because of their increased costs, and so they're they're looking to either increase the rents or to um, to re to re-advertise the property, and there's then uh, and there's and that's therefore seeing the sort of increase in the new new rents, which has has come forward more quickly, but then the existing rents are going to um, to roll out eventually as well. Um, most landlords don't seek to um, increase rents um you know on a regular basis um and there are a lot of te existing tenancies where the rents will be under the market rate so that readjustment can have quite a big impact when it if it happens at a you know a later time than if it had happened consistently within a tenancy and, and richard do you do you think if we if we got a big shift in interest rates if the bank of england starts slashing rates what will sort of effect do you think that would that would start to have on on, on these markets i think um i'd look at it almost on the other landlord end because if, if the if the rental markets a conveyor belt towards home ownership effectively for first time buyers now a lot of young people love renting love the flexibility so not everyone wants to do that but i think the the challenge of higher interest rates has pushed mortgage rates up has pushed bank has pushed bank stress rates up so if you want to be a first time buyer today you go to your bank they're going to stress test you whether you can afford an eight or nine percent mortgage rate, uh, not just a four and a half percent rate you're going to pay. It, that that's a huge impact on the south of England. It means the income you need to buy a home is up in six figures in London. It's in the very high double figures of seventy five thousand, eighty thousand in the south of England, and that that's just trapping people in the rental market, and it's just adding to the demand side pressures. So I think. Even if rates start falling, in base rates start falling, we've got an average mortgage rate of, say, 4.5%. I personally just don't see it getting below 3.5%, So, And those stress rates are still going to remain pretty high. So we've just got a, the success of mortgage regulation in stopping boom-bust in house prices has come at a, another, a, another cost to society, particularly being felt by renters, where they simply are sort of trapped in, in renting and adding to those demand side pressures. And I think, um, I think, and I think it's really, I'd echo the point about the space. I do think one of the reasons rents have gone up quite a lot, particularly in some cities, particularly London, is you just put more income units in a property. The, you know, the rent can go up basically. And I think that when we start comparing home ownership costs versus renting costs, this, this occupancy variation is one area you guys have been doing some great work on, but it's, we need to go much further in understanding that because again, it, the people are compromising on the space, the living standards they have just to sort of be economically active in a certain part of the country. And, and Cara, we, you, people will have in mind that um, re, uh, real pay is not really rising all that much. How, how should we think about what's happening to pay and how that's that's feeding through into rents. Yeah, I think it's an important point because like, you could come away from this and say, well, rent's gone up, but actually earnings have also gone up. Where's the problem? You're still paying the same share of your, your earnings on, on rent. Um, and I guess the sort of obvious point there is that um, we've seen massive increases in lots of other essentials over the cost of living prices. So like food prices have gone up like 25% since 2022. So people are spending a lot of their pay on a lot higher proportions of their pay on other essentials, and that's going to make it even harder um, to afford uh, housing costs, even if those housing costs haven't actually increased this year, a share of their incomes. And I guess the other point to make is that sort of average earnings growth might be tracking kind of average rents, but there's a lot of people who haven't been receiving that that kind of average earnings growth, particularly say if you're a public sector worker. We know that public sector pay has 
um, has, has really lagged behind private sector pay. So there's definitely going to be groups of people who are really feeling the pinch kind of more than others. All right, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, where, I, where I started here, and, and that's the effect on uh, living standards uh, from, from all this. So I'm going to take uh, a question from Mark here. Um, now, now, Mark takes us down a, a slightly uh, depressing route, so we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll start with Carr on this, but um, basically whether the, the, what effect is the rising, uh, the rising rents really and, and housing costs writ large having in terms of um, uh, what we're seeing across a range of living standard, standards metrics. Now, uh, Mark mentions quite a few here. Uh, we, we don't need to, to cover all these, but um, Cara, can you um, uh, talk a bit about um, what's been happening here, why, why it's so important, what's, what's happening to rents? Yeah, I guess, um, again, the point to make is that we might not have seen massive increases in housing costs as a share of incomes over past years, but they are at a really high level, and we know that they're at a high level um, compared to lots of other, other countries as well. The UK has a kind of particularly um, expensive and particularly kind of uh, low value in terms of compared to what you're paying, sort of housing market at the moment. Um, and we do know that that has um, potential effects on, on, on growth. We know that if you see sort of growth in, in sort of areas of the UK, we did some work looking at the UK's second cities um, earlier in the year. And um, kind of if you want a higher growth economy, you know that coming with that tends to be higher housing costs. And unless you see kind of an expansion of housing supply at the same time, then those high housing costs are probably going to erode a lot of the benefit in terms of incomes. Um, particularly kind of for, for existing residents of high growth areas. Um, and also, I mean, in terms of inequality, we know it's having really significant impacts on intergenerational inequality. Um, to the fact that you have like, an entire generation who are very unlikely to, to become um, homeowners and, and kind of have that, that sort of housing wealth it is, is a really sort of significant kind of gear shift we've seen. Um, and that, that, has, that has huge knock on effects for, for kind of intergenerational inequality. Um, I guess there's, there's sort of a lot of other factors there as well. I mean, you could you could talk about um, climate change and the fact that a lot of our, our rental stock is very kind of, we have a very old um, housing stock. A lot of it's very poorly insulated. That's a big kind of cost. And it's also a cost for kind of the government. It's a cost for individuals in terms of high high energy costs. It's going to be a cost for the government to kind of remediate if we want to meet, meet sort of net zero. Um, so yeah, a whole a whole range of challenges. I think need need long term solutions if we're going to um, deal not just with the fact that kind of we have um, yeah we have we have problems in the rental sector, but I guess there are symptoms of, of a much wider problem in our housing market. R Richard, do you do you pick up elements of that? Do you see areas, pockets, in, in these markets where you 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 see you get to the point where demand is just sort of um, uh, starts to be destroyed by the sheer cost of, of renting and, and that starts to pop up in, in, the, in the local markets? Well, I think there's a there's definitely a sort of there's a social cost as highlighted in the question, which we alluded to. And again, it's not something that people aren't really measuring. And so people have longer commutes. You know, this the fact that rents are going up in areas adjacent to big cities shows you that people are just having to go and find value for money. I think the other challenge with kind of create, you know, very high levels of demand is the people with the biggest incomes just outbid those on the lower incomes, which again adds to that sort of pressure on, on low income families. I, I think with all of this stuff, and we probably have been quite negative this morning, I mean, there's, I think particularly, um, again, I, I see a particular problem in housing and housing costs in the south of England, basically. I do think things get slightly better. And frankly, you go to Scotland, they're actually quite, you know, housing's reasonably affordable, actually. So I think we, we need to think carefully about, um, um, but obviously with a third of the rental market being in London, you kind of can't help but sort of have these figures skewed towards London. But there's a south of England problem on housing costs, which creates these sort of overspill effects. But again, in the Midlands and north of England, they're there, but to a lesser degree. But I still think the, the lack of housing for people on low incomes, particularly those on, on housing benefits, is a challenge nationally. Right now, we've been we've been talking about what's been driving rents up, so we are going to give you a little poll on this. Um, so basically, um, 
we're, we're and I'm, I'm going to ask our, our panel members to do some prognostication um, in a moment. But basically, we're we're sort of say asking you here, where is the rental market going? Are we are we basically uh, we, we've heard Cara say we're going to see a slowing in new rents. That'll take a time for that to feed into the the stock as a whole. Uh, but how do people? How do other people see it? Do they see? Um, do they see that sort of four percent type number over the next few years that uh, Car has been talking about? Is that roughly the sort of right um, level of rental growth that we rental price growth that we should expect, or is it just going to carry on? Are we just going to see more of the same really fast rental price growth? Um, so that's our sort of first option here. And then the final one is basically it sort of hits a wall. We just can't carry on like this forever. Uh, gravity must take hold at some point. We'll actually see much lower rental price growth. So that's the poll. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Mira and Richard where, where, they, where they stand. I, I think you've been sort of hinting at it a little bit. But, but where, where, where do you see things going? Um, I think... Uh the around 4% is, is probably um, the, the likely scenario. We are continuing to see um, high interest rates at the moment. It doesn't seem like those are heading downwards um, that soon. Um, I agree with Richard, they're not going to return to the, uh, the days of 1%, 2% interest rates. So I think that that's going to have an impact um, as well as... Um, the uh, the sort of continued demand in the sector. I don't think that the I, just, I don't think there's an endless amount of uh, rent uh, increase that the the, the um, market can sustain. Um, but whilst there's still that demand and supply imbalance, you're going to see int- you're going to see rents um, rents increasing. I'm going to ask you to nail your colours to a mast in terms of in terms of numbers. Are you are you sort of in the <laughs> in the slow down a bit camp, but but not as crazy as it is. As yeah, it is that's what I said at okay. the beginning. <laughs> okay, right, good. Um, I, I, like maybe a five point. No, anyway, um, <laughs> let's not let's not try and uh, pin it down to exact numbers. How about you, Richard? Where, where yeah, the middle one. But I think it, you know, rents are going to rise a bit faster than that in the next eighteen months or so. There's just there's some momentum. There's this value for money piece. The supply side is not going to get better. Mortgage rates are not going to come down fast enough to ease the pressure. So um, it'll be for the middle one in three years' time, but it'll it's probably not going to grow slow as fast as we'd like in the next eighteen months. All right, we are we are in danger of furious agreement here. So I'm, I'm, before I show you the results, people in the room, I'm going to come to you next with the uh, the question. So we'll we'll do that next. Now I'm hoping. See, I can see the results. That's the exciting thing is, ah, now you all can too. Now, what I like about this is nobody is optimistic. <laughs> hit the wall. For quite a long time, this, this poll was basically at 0% for, for very low levels of rent increases. But we still have a third thinking it's just going to carry on. So um, uh, hopefully they're all landlords who are going to enter the market. So that, that, would, be, uh, that, would, be, uh, that would be helping us now. Um, are there questions in the room? We have two hands up. Why don't we try and get all three of these questions? Um, if you can just say your name uh, before you and where you're from uh, before you um, ask the question, that'd be great. Uh, yes, it's um, James Pargeter from the uh, UK Single Family Association. Um, I was particularly interested in the, the slide, Kari, you put up about um, the, the net um, you know, reduction in, in stock. Uh, and I was just wondering, initially, what does that include or exclude the sort of the purpose-built rental sector, so either the built-to-rent, the single-family, co-living, perhaps, um, th- th- that's coming through? I, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the departure from the market of individual landlords greater than that appears? I know it's being backfilled at, to some extent by by the built to rent sector, um, or is that a separate factor altogether? And, and I suppose it then opens out to sort of what what do, do the panel feel that the built to rent sector can bring to uh, helping that supply uh, situation in the future? All right, let's take the one at the back. 
Hello, I'm Helen Rowe. I wrote a book, Eliminating Poverty in Britain. Um, I'm interested in rent controls. So 70% of Londoners currently agree with implementing rent controls. Therefore, it's an election issue, potentially. Um, I'm curious, I haven't seen any really detailed analysis of the impact of bringing in rent controls on, um, on Britain generally. And yet, it's happened in New York, it's happened in Paris and Berlin. So I wondered if you, um, if you had a kind of feeling about whether or not you feel it should come in or not, um, what you think the impact would be. All right, we've got one more round here. Uh, Piers Williamson from the Housing Finance Corporation. I th think this is, this is uh, mainly a question for Richard. Some of your statistics are fascinating, Richard. You say 25% of renters are effectively universal credit or housing benefit cases. Six to seven, six to seven percent of your homes could be rented to UC cases. A third of rental stock is in London. If you look at homelessness and people falling out of the bottom of the system, can you give a statistic of, of what proportion of renters are on 100% or near 100% um, benefit, because it, it, it worries me that the, I guess the vast majority are not, and in terms of affordability, they are having to make up the difference to be able to stay in their property. If they can't do that, they get Section 21 at the minute. What, why don't we start with that? <laughs> Very direct question. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have the numbers to hand, but are you are you are you seeing the the impact of, uh, of benefits? Um, you know, the uh, in terms of that being a, a major constraint on some sort of parts of the the rental market. I haven't got the exact figures, but uh, around that, I think it's it clearly impacts families who you know the, the housing elements is, is, and so I think this is probably one of the reasons we're seeing rents going up in adjacent markets it's why you've had this potentially flow out of social tenants into sort of adjacent areas particularly around London so it's something we're going to look at again um, this year I'm um, going to update the numbers to see what the LHA rate does what we do know from our research is you know clearly the closer the LHA rate is to the market rate the more likely our landlords are to supply housing so in areas where there's a massive gap between the market and LHA you get a lot less supplies so and there's more pressure on social landlords waiting lists etc. And, and Cara uh, so um, obviously you know we, we've got this um, change on uh, LHA rates uh, we're finally getting those operated for, for the first time what what really has been the impact um, in terms of those LHA rates um, on uh, low income, low income renters. Like, what what have we been seeing in terms of what's what's happening on the on the rental market? I suppose one thing to to touch on here is what's been happening with uh, homelessness as well as a, as a sort of extreme version of this. Yeah, well, I mean, um, until the uprating that we've seen from this month onwards, was announced kind of back in the autumn, um, uh, LHA rates were frozen since 2020, so since the pandemic, when the government last kind of reset them to match market rents and as we've kind of shown lots of all, all the figures we've talked about today rents have surged over that period so which is why we get to the kind of figures that, that Richard's been talking about in terms of very few properties actually being affordable under the rates as they were at that point and um, we have been seeing kind of increases in the really sharp end in sort of families in temporary accommodation and um, and homelessness as well which you kind of expect if if you end up in a situation where kind of most um, most properties are unaffordable under the local housing allowance. Um, so it's really positive that we are now seeing kind of um, LHA rates being being rematched to rents from this year. I think that that's a really, really welcome um, change. I guess the two caveats we've added is that at the moment that is a commitment for this year and then no commitment kind of for future years. At the moment, they're just forecasts remain frozen in the years ahead. As we know, we're still expecting significant rental price growth over those years. So that will be kind of a real, a real pinch point for a lot of renters who rely on this. Um, to pay their housing costs and the other point which we've mentioned a bit in passing is the benefit cap um, which caps the overall kind of amount of, of support you can get from the government um, has been frozen in nominal terms um, for sort of, uh, 2015 2013 um, but that means that for a lot of renters in higher higher housing cost areas um, if they're getting kind of the full 
um, LHA getting the kind of full coverage for their housing costs and their housing costs are high because they live in an area where housing costs are high, they're hitting that benefit cap and therefore just not receiving most of that, that, that local housing allowance, which means that they're going to be struggling to pay those housing costs as well. So scrapping the benefit cap and committing to upgrade to LHA is going to be really important if we're going to support low income families. Yes, yeah, so this is a very extreme end of the, the cost of living crisis. Now, now, Mira, I'm going to turn to you for this question of uh, rent controls. Um, so, um, you know, this is something that has, has come up uh, quite a few times. As, as we've heard, there are some big cities where rent controls are, are, are notably in place. What, what, what sort of effect do you think, uh, and the counter argument, I suppose, to that is often that rent controls would stop landlords actually entering the market. What, what sort of effect do you think um, rent controls might have? And then I'll, I'll get Richard's view on this as well. So, um, yes, we, we did actually have rent controls um, in England prior to the 1980s. And what we saw was um, a discouragement of investment in the market, um, including both actually letting properties, but also investment in the quality, um, the condition of, of um, homes in the, uh, in the private rented sector. And I think uh, on top of that, we also have a real issue around um, whether rent controls support those people who are already in tenancies or the people that are, whereas it, it can be detrimental for people who are looking to enter into the private rented sector. And that's something that you see in parts of the US where rent controls have been introduced already. So I don't think rent controls are the answer, particularly when we're facing a supply crisis. We want to encourage more investment in the sector to provide more homes. And when that demand and supply challenge is addressed, then that will help to release the pressure on rents. All right, Richard, how do you see it? Um, look, rent control means different things to different people. Um, <laughs> So the rent controls a lot of property long, uh, you know, people who remember going back to St. Paul, a lot of investors remember rent controls after the war where rents were set at a fair rent. That's about 5% of the open market rent. Now that obviously caused a big disinvestment. So I think what most investors, long-term investors, long-term buy-to-let landlords would be happy with rent stabilisation, where the rent is set at the market rent when the property's let, but then there's more, you know, the, the level at which rents can increase over the tenancy is linked to a CPI or something like that, basically. I think people are broadly happy with that type of rent control. I think other types of rent control where you're trying to sort of manipulate force rents, almost never let the, mar the, the rent reset to the market level. Because again, rents can go down as well as up. Um, it's not, you know, we're in an up phase at the moment. So that's my position on rent controls is I think rent stabilization is what a lot of uh, other cities have. That's kind of okay. But where we try and really sort of work down rents to half their current levels, don't let the market rent reset, you're just going to have a quite a big supply, you know, supply side sort of exodus, which obviously isn't good for rents. All right. So we're not fans of rent control here, unfortunately. Um, just turning to James's question about um, the build to rent sector, um, and um, I guess. Uh, I guess it's one for Cara to, to perhaps start with. Um, is, is, this, is this something that we just need to encourage? Is it that um, what we need to see here is um, uh, a, a much more of a focus on the rental sector in general? We should just build for that. We should just create investment vehicles for uh, people to, to save that way. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Um, to Come back and quickly on your sort of specific point of that that sort of um, chart I showed of the sort of outflow of landlords. Um, so that's based on some. It's a really difficult question to get in the data um, because you don't have in England at least a kind of just a register of how many people are landlords. So it's actually really tricky to work out what's been happening. We know kind of some landlords are saying they might want to leave the sector, um, but actually trying to work out how people sold up, how people left, it's, it's been a real challenge I think for a lot of analysts at the moment. Um, the Bank of England research that we're using there is, I think, kind of one of the most granular ways they've tried to do it. And they've, I think, looked at, I think, used Zipla data, possibly, um, but looked at properties that were previously rented, were then sold, and they've got kind of a transaction for it, and then aren't back on the platform as a rented property. Um, so that does mean they're probably missing, I think, demolitions they'll miss, because you don't, if something disappears genuinely, 
and it's then kind of we put on a property portal um, they probably wouldn't capture that and possibly might not capture all of built to rent as well so I think some really interesting analysis from the Bank of England that we're using there and probably the most kind of cutting edge of the trying to work out what's happening but yeah I think you're right that it may slightly underestimate build to rent. I think the wider question of how exactly do we expand supply and do you focus on build to rent? Do you just kind of focus on build? I think a lot of that is kind of determined by the market and determined by what what is kind of viable in different different locations. I guess the sort of policy side of it is probably more about kind of how you encourage social housing, um, and that that's kind of probably something that where the government probably needs to take a more active role. Whereas I think kind of probably more agnostic on what the kind of market wants in terms of um, build to rent versus kind of other tenure types. Right, now um, we, we, um, uh, we're going to finish with some policy, but, but before we do that, and I'm going to ask everybody's view on, on policy, so prepare yourself for that. But um, first let's um, do this um, question. Now, now Cara has already touched on the sort of intergenerational aspects of all this. Um, and I'm going to ask Richard to, to comment on this first. But we have a question, basically, which, which sort of says um, people should stop saying that uh, younger people in the rental market love renting. Um, well, what's, what's your take? Do you, do you see um, younger renters banging down your door at, at Zoopla? Is, is, that, is that what's going on here? I think there are people who do like it. Again, I, again, I just know because I've... When you, when you write an analysis about renting versus buying and you write it on the basis everyone want, every young person wants to buy a property, which is what the long-term stats say, about 80% of people expect to own, you do get the uh, adverse comments coming back going, stop talking to me as if I only want to buy a property, you know, always want to buy a property, basically. So I think it's, it's, um, it, it all depends on who you are and what you're renting and the income you're on, basically. And I, again, I, I do think there are people that... Again, in certain parts of the market where there are decent landlords, with, which is the majority, with decent quality homes, etc. But what, because it's a market under extreme pressure, it's meeting a effectively a social need. It's stepping in for the lack of social housing, as well as dealing with the private market. You're, you're always going to get a different view of kind of what that sector is delivering. And there are examples of great stuff, as well as a smaller set of examples of, of a poor outcome for, for tenants, basically. And Miri, you were talking about um, the age profile of landlords. So, so the, uh, are landlords um, changing in terms of their, their age distribution? Are we seeing younger people wanting to become landlords? Yeah, I think there's, there, there are younger people entering into the sector. There's a kind of cohort of people who'd invested to invest in their pension 20-odd um, years ago. Um, those people are getting to the point where they are thinking about disinvesting or um, sort of moving their portfolios on. So I think there is an opportunity for some people to see um, the private rental sector as an, as an investment op opportunity as they think about different options that they have. Um, so the profile of landlords is shifting um, and uh, potentially moving away um, gradually from those sort of one, two property uh, landlords in the market. Right. The, um, uh, the, we, 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 we touched very briefly on what's going on elsewhere when we're talking about uh, rent controls, but before we um, get on to, to policy, Cara, we're, we're, we just, you know, we, in England, are we just getting this totally wrong? Are we on our own? Is it, you know, is this entirely a, a sort of UK phenomenon? What, what, what's, uh, what, what do we see elsewhere? Yeah, well, I think we've have sort of done previous analysis showing that we are kind of the worst value for money country in terms of housing. We're not, this is not just a kind of, ever as a housing crisis, we shouldn't be worried. Uh, the UK has a sort of specifically, um, specifically acute housing crisis at the moment. I think the other thing, interesting going back to this question is, I think the other version of this you sometimes hear is, um, sort of in other countries people rent for all of their lives we should we're just obsessed with home ownership you know it, this isn't actually a problem um, and I guess the point to make there is that in a lot of other countries the private rental sector is a lot more highly regulated you have kind of um, you don't have sort of no no fault evictions you have a kind of a far secure rental sector and maybe in that context that might be a kind of sector you'd want to stay in for longer in your life whereas in the UK as this kind of question points out private rental sector is much purer quality than any other housing tenure and it's also kind of the least secure um, and that's increasingly a problem because I guess as this question points out maybe there are younger people who enjoy the flexibility 
but we now know that the kind of proportion of people who are renting for more than 10 years has shot up. Um, about one in five families with children in the UK now are in the private rented sector. And that's kind of obviously a lot less kind of um, appropriate, particularly if you're in kind of a sector where you can be evicted at very short notice. But Mira, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about the power balance between uh, landlords and tenants. So uh, perhaps, and uh, Cara just touched on it then, we, we've had this promised end to, to no-fault evictions for for years now, um, and you know, there's all sorts of policies that people would would advocate that would um, help pe people in the rent sector. We haven't seen much of that implemented. I suppose you know, rent control being being one of those. What do, what would you say to people who say you know, there's just vested interests here, and uh, landlords, uh, you know, uh, we, we we know a lot of MPs, for example, are, are landlords. Do you do you think that's um, that's affecting the market? that a lot of MPs are landlords. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've got so many houses. Um. Um, I think, uh, well, the reality is that um, the majority of landlords don't actually issue Section 21s regularly. Uh, most of our members aren't issuing Section 21s to their uh, tenants to end the tenancy. It's the, the vast majority of tenancies are ended by the tenant themselves. Um, you would be surprised how many times you meet you, you you speak to landlords and they've never issued a section 21 ever uh, because it's it, they have a good tenancy that's progressing well. They want to keep the tenant in the property because they are uh, have a good relationship with them. They're paying their rents on time. The tenant then chooses to move on at, at the point that they, they want to. So I'm not saying that there isn't a perception of insecurity because of the existence of section 21, but I think the reality is that to the vast majority of tenants, they are able to enjoy um, the use of a, a, a home that is comfortable and, and suitable for them um, without, uh, as the question poses, the, the constant threat of eviction. But um, I think that the, the reforms which have been proposed need to come through um, with certainty for landlords, they know the market that they're going to be working in and the, the environment in which they're going to be operating. Without that certainty, it just discourages investment and discourages landlords from, from remaining in the sector or from investing in the future, and that is compounding the supply issue. So, so let's turn to, to policy generally uh, with, with, uh, with that in mind. Now, um, so this is a little poll for you all to, to vote on. I'm, I'm going to basically ask our panel to, uh, we, we've touched a bit on policy already, but I'm going to um, ask our panel to touch on what, what the one thing that would uh, really make a difference here. So, so we've, we've given you four options in terms of, uh, in terms of what, uh, what one policy you could have. This, this is fairly sort of Brexit-like. Because we've got build more homes as if that's a magic wand that, that can be waved here. But we've also got specific things in terms of boosting local housing allowance, help people on uh, lower incomes, banning no-fault evictions, as we were uh, just hearing about. But also wh whether we should just use the financial sector to try and get people out of the, uh, of the rental sector in terms of... Um, in terms of their, uh, in terms of you know, actually going on to to buy a house. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna come to Richard first, um, and then Mira, and then Cara in terms of uh, what what policy, what one policy, and it doesn't have to be one of these. That'd be nice if uh, this poll that um, we've come up with was actually the right one. But um, uh, what what one thing do you think would would make a real difference here? I think going off this list of four, it would be building more homes, basically. I think we've, we've talked about um, all the problems and we, you know, we've just got to empower consumers with more choice. There is very, very little consumer choice at work in the housing market. And therefore, all of the kind of negative things we've heard are more possible if there's not enough um, choice. So it's a, it's a massive challenge and worthy of a couple of other seminars about how you're going to build more homes, how we're going to reform the planning <laughs> system. Um, but again, I think um, 
And again, you don't have to build that many homes that fast to start actually causing an impact on pricing. But you, you have to build, you'd have to build more homes, but also have a balance. So you'd have to have fixed percentage of affordable private rent home ownership, basically. And um, it's just not without its challenges, but that's the one I think that's the only way we're going to ease some of these pressures is, is adding to supply. And we've seen in the past when landlords do invest and come into the market at speed, it disrupts rents and rents can fall. So, um, so more more supply would be mine. The other ones are all they're all uh, worthy things to discuss, but they're kind of sorting out the problem, which is fundamentally linked to a lack of supply. Mira, where where are you on this? Um, yes, I'd agree with Richard. In in the long term, build more homes. Successive governments have failed to meet their house building targets, and we're seeing the impact of that. I think in the shorter term. Um, the government could make a difference by looking at the tax regime for landlords and in, and boosting supply through pro growth measures. So uh, we have uh, we commissioned some modelling from Capital Economics, which showed that the three percent stamp duty surcharge on additional properties, if that was removed, it would increase supply by nine hundred thousand over ten years, um, and it would also boost treasury re revenues by ten billion pounds over that same period because of the increase in uh, income and corporation tax. Similarly, um, reinstating the mortgage interest relief would um, save one in seven PRS properties from leaving the market, and um, uh, sorry, save one in seven properties that would otherwise that that would otherwise not have been invested in the market and would also halve uh, the tax impact of those lost properties. So there are some things which the government can do in the shorter term to boost supply, but ultimate with, with tax changes, but ultimately building more homes. Right. Cara, now I'm going to give the last word to you before we show the results of this, which I, I don't think are going to surprise people too much. But anyway, what, what would, where are you standing? Yeah, I mean, I think Build more homes is, I guess, the kind of um, the sort of solution to the the problem that I mean, particularly sort of looking at operating local housing allowance. If we have a bigger social rented sector, then you'd hope that kind of fewer people will be reliant on government support to be paying very high rents in the private center sector. Um, and similarly, sort of banning no fault evictions is, is sort of really crucial in terms of stability. Um, but I think I, I might actually, I'm going to go for operating local housing allowance, given that's the kind of most <laughs> pressing current issue right now. Um, even if I do agree with the panellists that building more homes is kind of crucial for the long term. Thank you. Well, this has been excellent. Now, let me show you what, what people actually thought about this. So there's a very, very strong message coming from this morning. It would be good if, uh, if there were a few more homes built, but um, the um, LHA policy here is also a very important one in terms of um, helping people on, on low income. So a very, a very clear consensus here, I, I would say. Um, all right, that's it. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. Let's thank all the panellists here for their excellent contributions. And if everyone could go out and build some homes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you.